What's good, YouTube? Steph here. Welcome to Theta Space. Today I'm reviewing the self-titled debut album by King of Kings. <laughs> Okay, let me set the scene. It's summer 1989. I'm two years out of high school living with my dad in Hermosa Beach, California, and I'm going to school at El Camino College in Torrance. And one day I find out that Hawkwind is coming to a venue in Hollywood on their 20th anniversary acid tour. I've already loved Hawkwind for a few years now. They're one of the first rock bands I really got into after Pink Floyd and Yes, so of course I'm going. Night of the show, I arrive at the theater and Hawkwind is headlining a bill of three with Death Ride 69, and the opening act is called King of Kings, who come on stage as a power trio fronted by the bassist, and they start their set with Om Namah Shivaya, uh, which is a song I'm familiar with from Steve Hillage's second solo album, L. They don't play anything else I recognize, but... I did enjoy them. They were very well suited to be an opening act for Hawkwind, uh, as far as I was concerned. Fast forward to 1992, I'm browsing used CDs in a store with my best friend from college, and I come across a King of Kings album in the bargain bin. It's only two dollars, so of course I pick it up. It's been in my collection ever since. Yeah. I ended up going back to that record store and buying all the copies of the CD that they had, about half a dozen copies, and giving them to my friends. One gave it back after listening to it, saying it really wasn't his thing. It was too preachy, he said. I'm not sure what he was talking about, because um, despite the name, King of Kings isn't a Christian band. Their lyrics are kind of vaguely hippie, New Age leaning, with a few references to Eastern Oriental mysticism. Uh, but I never got any feeling of being proselytized to. You know what hard rock album I find overly preachy? Okay, so back to the here and now. King of Kings was a psychedelic heavy rock trio, not to be confused with a band of the same name, uh, founded by one Brandon Payne of Fort Worth, Texas. All Music calls them a progressive rock trio and has a brief bio that says they formed in 1988, playing around New York and later San Francisco. After they played in front of Frank Hannon from Tesla, he introduced them to an exec from Geffen Records who signed them to the label. They spent over a year writing and recording and released the self-titled album in 1991. We got the front cover here with uh, somebody hanging. That might even be the lead singer and bassist Desmond Horn. Uh, hanging from a tree like the hanged man from the tarot card. We got on the back there, we have our track listing in a, two circles around the that cover artwork. There's the CD, and I can see a stamp up there that says promotional up there, so apparently I have a promotional copy. The uh, little sigil that's all over the CD there is the Unicursal Hexagram, which uh, I'm familiar with from Aleister Crowley, uh, except this has a little dove in the center. Uh, there's a bigger picture of it inside the album art. So the band is, uh, again, fronted by Desmond Horn uh, on lead vocals, bass guitar, keyboards, acoustic guitar, Piano, glockenspiel, tubular bells, percussion, dulcimer, devices, and trips, trips with two Ps, along with Gus Hart on drum kit, tabla, timpani, and percussion, and Kevin O'Neill on electric and acoustic guitars and backing vocals. Some uh, extra musicians uh, are credited as additional clamor, uh, Francis Nicola on extra guitars and fellowship, Juare, uh, inspiration and vigor, not to mention munching, there is, uh, on the last track, opens with some crunchy sounds, so I suppose that's the munching. Uh, Max Vanderwolf on saxophone and conversation. Uh, all songs arranged by King of Kings, uh, engineered by Paul R. Church, recorded at Topanga Skyline Studios and mixed at Roombo Studios, spring 1990. Mastered by George Marino at Sterling Sound. Art direction and illustration by Desmond Horn, photography by Marty Tim, and design coordination by Robert Fisher, photo manipulation, Desmond and Robert. Uh, so we got the album artwork here. Uh, there's that unicursal hexagram uh, that I mentioned. Crowley's design usually has a five-leafed clover in the center, uh, not a falling dove. Uh, we got a little bunch of text there, uh, which is kind of some uh, pseudo-mystical rambling, I suppose. Uh, I imagine it was written by Desmond Horn. The color side has uh, 
That's Desmond Horn there, bass and vocals and other instruments. Uh, Gus Hart on drums there, and Kevin O'Neill on the guitars there. Uh, supposedly, uh, Desmond Horn drew the painting and whatnot. Uh, most notably, this album was produced by Roy Thomas Baker, uh, who is known for working with a lot of artists, such as The Cars, Journey, Foreigner, Alice Cooper, Nazareth, and five Queen albums, including A Night at the Opera. Uh, that's right. You heard right. This is the guy who co-produced Bohemian Rhapsody, and he produced this album, too. I don't know the music business at all, but uh, that seems like a hell of a get for an unknown band recording their first record. <laughs> so the album opens with The Phantom Show of Space and Time, which starts with piano and tubular bells and some synthesizer or tape effects, and then a five-note figure on electric guitar joined by the bass playing it in double time high up on the neck, before starting into the main groove in 3-4 or maybe a faster 6-4. This changes into a different four beat groove uh, before Horn starts singing in a low register. And I can't understand any of the words, but it just repeats and fades out. It's not really heavy, not particularly interesting, but it's not awful either. I don't think anything on this album is straight up awful, but this is not one of my favorite tracks on the record. Of the 11, it's in my bottom three. Track two, Don't You Ever Go Away, is a lot better. It's got a chunky groove and horn sings in his usual register. I think he's a low tenor. There's a middle section where the band drops out and we hear some Middle Eastern or Indian sounding instruments uh, before the band comes back in hard for the last verse and chorus. Seasons of Eve, the third track, is another heavy rocker, but more up-tempo, riffy and high energy, more so than the previous track. I'll say Desmond Horn is not a great singer, but he's a decent fit for this music, and he's a very proficient bass player, I'll certainly give him that, and he's adequate on the inst other instruments that he plays. So. The fourth track changes the pace. Uh, Written All Over You is a mostly acoustic track, more laid back than the previous two. It's all right, but not one of my favorites on the album, but then it's followed by probably the best track, The Awakening. Uh, this is the proggiest song on the album, and the second longest at eight and a half minutes. It starts out at a fast tempo with a 60s sounding guitar before it settles down into a slow mellow verse with the drums dropping out and horns singing low in his range. Then it kicks into high gear for another vocal part, completely different from the verse we just heard. An extended solo break with electric and acoustic guitars trading fours. Uh, maybe Desmond Horn is playing the acoustic, I don't know. Uh, this segues into a slow, spacey vamp with piano and synthesized horns. Uh, it goes back into the heavy part and from there into the final verse similar to the first, but Horn sings it an octave higher. Uh, one last brief reprise of the frenetic opening part ends the song. So while I think The Awakening is the best track on the album, it's actually not my favorite. That would be the following track, number six, Shame, which is kind of proggy psych that starts out heavy AF, uh, moves into a slow mellow verse and gets heavy again for the chorus. The second verse goes into a completely different heavy chorus where the first is just shame, obsessing over shame. There's more words on the second one. Take me over, and your honor, second mile home. Come on over, yes, your honor, dances overthrown, or something like that. There's no lyrics sheet, and I uh, just am left to muddle the best I can out of what I can hear. There's a solo break after this in odd time signatures, mixing bars of six and five, then going slow and heavy again for the final chorus and outro. But that's not the end of the track. As the last power chord's fading away, there's a short little bebop jazz jam, guitar and bass and drums with an occasional saxophone that goes for six verses of a 12-bar blues. It's completely incongruous with the preceding song, but it's still part of track six, so what can you do? Kind of gimmicky, but I like it anyway. Uh, the rest of the album is pretty mid to me. Burning Horn and Stone by Stone are heavy. I like the latter track better. In between them is a slow, bluesy popologist, which I don't think much of because I've been kind of over the blues for a number of years now, at least a decade. It's uh, my least favorite track on the album. Uh, it's down there with Phantom Show. But then there's the album closer, Dweller on the Seventh Floor. It's a three-part suite, almost 14 minutes long. A part one, Invocation of the Great Cosmic Beings, is basically just horn noodling on the bass with heavy effects, doing Van Halen-type tapping with some synthesizer drones behind him. This section is mercifully brief, 
And part two, A Study in Aesthetics, is actually up with shame in The Awakening for me, uh, one of my favorite songs on the album. I just love the slow, heavy guitar riffs in this one. It's got mellow verses in between the heavy riffing, so it's like shame in that respect. And there's a spoken word verse with more of Horn's pseudo-mystical babble. Uh, that might sound like I'm defecating on the song, but I'm not here. I think it works okay. The third part, Locust, mixes up a whole bunch of different grooves and moods, goes through a d bunch of different sections, kind of like The Awakening does. And the final vocal section sort of loops the album back around to the beginning. Not literally, but it reprises the piano part that we heard in the opening part of Phantom Show with Space and Time. And that's what we go out on. There's a review of this LP up on All Music by Stephen McDonald, who praises Roy Thomas Baker's massive sounding production, but he calls the record utter rubbish with, quote, directionless writing and poor performances, and Horn's voice, untrained and toneless. So what do I think? I don't quite agree with Mr. McDonald's assessment. He has a point about Horn singing, but as I said before, I think it works for this record. I wouldn't call the material utter rubbish, but with the exception of a couple of tracks, it's not great. Most of it is pretty mediocre. Still enjoyable for the most part, but just okay in quality. On a scale with 10 at the top, I'd give this record a 5 if I'm being generous and thinking mostly about the three best songs, but honestly, it's more of a 4. I've uploaded this album track by track back in June 2015, and uh, I'll link to my playlist in uh, the end cards so you can listen for yourself. Also, a link where you can get the second album, Who's Your Guru, in a zip file. Uh, unfortunately, in alphabetical title order with no track numbers, so it's anyone's guess what the proper sequencing is. But what can you do? If you've heard this record or listened to it here on the YouTubes, uh, leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Also, please click the subscribe button and notification bell. They don't cost anything. I'm not sure what the next video is going to be. Uh, keep watching the space if you care. And I'll see you next time. Steph out.